Our next speaker is uh, arguably Australia's most accomplished female weightlifter. She's a two-time Olympian, five-time Commonwealth Games representative, seven times World Championship representative, and she was the first woman inducted into the Australian Weightlifting Federation Hall of Fame. Uh, she's undertaking her Masters in Teaching and Learning. Uh, when I met her a couple of months ago, I invited her over. She said she had a really good excuse for not coming in person, but being with us by Zoom, and this is the reason. Uh, and this is um, number four for Deb from two weeks ago. We might even get to see her because uh, last night we did sitting on her lap. Deb will be back for Q&A after her presentation, but she's going to share basically uh, her short testimony, uh, and she joins us on Zoom. There she is, direct from Queensland. Deb, nice to have you here, and, and we're looking forward to hearing your story. Over to you. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I would like to start with a quote. Uh, it's from a presentation by Play by the Rules Australia, who in 2021 partnered with the Federal Government Department Sport Integrity Australia um, to combine national online training courses. So most of these training courses are required to be completed by sporting clubs, associations, coaches and athletes as part of their relevant participation in sport. So this is the quote. I think before we begin any meaningful discussion about transgender or intersex inclusion in sport, we really just have to take a step back and reflect a little bit on some of the assumptions that we have about sex and gender in general. I think these are concepts that we tend to take so much for granted that we rarely ask ourselves, what is it that we mean by them? We assume, for example, that all people can be categorised completely, neatly as either a man or a woman, and that just isn't true. So instead of thinking about sex and gender like two completely separate, discrete boxes, it can be really helpful to start thinking about biological sex characteristics, gender, identity, and gender presentation as three quite separate continuum like this. We all have biological sex characteristics and it's true, most of us would be located at either end of that line, but there's a whole range of people for a variety of reasons who find themselves much more towards the middle. And he goes on. <clears throat> so what's all that got to do with sport? In our sporting context, participation is almost exclusively segregated by sex and we tend to just assume that it's always going to be completely self-evident about whether someone should compete in the women's comp or the men's comp but we're not very clear on which criteria or which group of criteria we might rely upon to make that assessment. When the reality of someone's biology, gender identity and gender presentation doesn't fall completely neatly at the extremities of that sex gender continuum what is it that sport actually means when they say a woman or a man? Do you mean my biology? Which bits of it? My chromosomes? My genitals? What if I'm a person who has chromosomes that are neither XX nor XY? What if my ID documents show sex differently to the way that I identify and present? What if my ID documents show that my legal sex is neither male nor female, but is X? I'm pretty confident that even those of you who have a policy on this stuff would really struggle to articulate exactly how that policy would apply in each of those situations. And the point is here that we shouldn't do away with sex segregated sport, but the point is that when we choose to make a particular competition sex segregated, we need to be really clear about why. And unfortunately, there's no universally right or wrong answers to these questions. And the answers that you come up with in your individual sports that you're involved with and the level of competition that you talk about and the legal compliance obligations, there's all these different factors and it's just a really tricky situation. I really struggle to uh, get through that sometimes when I'm, <laughs> when I'm reading it. Um, it just really makes things seem like they're just so confusing. Um, I've always competed in the female category and all the boys that I know have, already, uh, have always competed in the male category. So in my mind, it's really not that confusing. Anyway, fairness underpins all sport. So I've been an athlete training in my sport since I was 14 years old. I spent 20 years of the prime of my years 
training and competing at the elite level, representing Australia in multiple sports, from athletics, placing third in the world as a discus thrower when I was 15, competing at national level track cycling championships, um, playing rugby, football, being selected for Australia, um, playing one season of that. And of course, my main sporting love, which is Olympic weightlifting that I did from 1998 to 2018. Right when I started weightlifting, when I was 14, um, in 1998, it had just been announced that the vote was carried, not unanimously, mind you, that women could finally compete and had the right to compete in the sport of weightlifting at the Olympic Games level for the very first time. And this was for the Sydney 2000 Olympics. So men had been competing in the sport since its inception as a foundation sport in the first since the first modern olympics of 1896 so it was 104 years that women waited to compete at the olympic games and also 52 years that women waited to compete at the commonwealth games in weightlifting and i was actually a member of that first ever women's weightlifting team to compete at the commonwealth games and it was such an amazing moment i competed at five consecutive commonwealth games winning a gold three silver and a bronze until 2018 at the gold coast where I competed against a biological male, the transgender weightlifter from New Zealand. And that's really why I'm speaking to you here today. So initially, when this athlete wanted to compete in the female category, this male athlete, um, the only requirement was that he have a GP sign off a medical or a gender certificate to confirm that he's going to be a female from here on. He got a list of new ID documents and only had to serve 12 months of not competing but being available to be drug tested, whereby his testosterone levels needed to be below a certain level. And this level was 10 nanomoles per litre. So once this 12 month period was complete, this athlete, a biological male, could then compete in the women's category. And that happened in 2017, the year before the Commonwealth Games, so that this male athlete could qualify to compete in the female category. So just to keep in mind that um, I only found this out at the end of last year that the average elite female athlete has the testosterone levels that are around 0.8 up to about one nanomoles per litre. But for some reason, the levels was um, at 10 nanomoles per litre. So just recently, our AIS, the Australian Institute of Sport, have just released their guidelines, which actually suggest 2.5 nanomoles per litre. So that's five times lower um, than what the New Zealand athlete uh, had to be. And they also recommend it for 24 months prior to the event. So that's a significant difference to five years ago at the Commonwealth Games. So this male athlete began to transition at 34 years of age after breaking national records as a junior male athlete, was the oldest ever athlete to debut at an Olympic Games in a foundation sport at the age of 43, and also came into the Tokyo Olympics as a real medal contender in the female category. So basically, fairness underpins all sport. So the following is just a few reasons why biological males in the, in the women's sport category is unfair. And I think there's a slide there, a table um, that explains this with a few little pictures. So again, this might sound pretty obvious, but um, this is a time where we need to really explain this. And um, men biologically, by majority, have far more upper body and lower body muscle mass than women. So about 66% more upper body mass than women, um, muscle mass, sorry, and 50% uh, more lower body muscle mass as well. So the broader shoulders, the larger hands and feet, which is an advantage for many sports. So particularly weightlifting, if you have big feet, you can actually push um, a larger space on the ground. Um, uh, uh, more force is produced through your feet and into the ground when picking up the weight. Larger hands can grip the bar better. And actually the grip strength is something that um, researchers found never reduces when testosterone actually reduces. So a male's grip strength should they try to transition, um, would actually keep that grip, grip strength as well. Uh, men have a larger heart to pump more blood around the body, um, particularly to the lungs, body tissue to give more oxygen. Um, this helps an athlete train at a higher level and a more intense physical rate. So men have bigger, stronger bones, a larger skeletal structure to hold more muscle. Larger bones obviously give better leverage, um, which is also an advantage. On average, men are taller, which gives an advantage in most sports higher hemoglobin levels. Um, and on average, there's an absolute minimum of 10% performance gap between the results of men and women. 
I mean, I always just, if it's a one-liner, I always just say to people that I've never seen a world or Olympic or a national record that's better for the women than the men. Um, and lastly, men have a greater amount of fast twitch muscle fibers, which give explosive power. So power is strength plus speed, and it's required in most sports. So um, speed is also another element that has been found that doesn't reduce for males who lower their testosterone levels. So in my mind, when you've got a, you know, a power sport and you've got an athlete that is just as fast, but maybe not quite as strong anymore, you've still got an advantage. Um, so on the next slide, it, it'll show that there's a boys versus women's website, which someone told me about, which I found really interesting because it shows performances um, in the US by high school boys in 2016 compared to the 2016 Rio female Olympians. Now, I just wanted to compare the 100, 200, 400 and 800 metre running and the 50, 100, 200, 400 freestyle swimming. So the high school boys won the top eight spots. So they, um, the female Olympians, the gold, silver and bronze, Olympic medalist and the Olympic record holders would have placed ninth in everything against these 16 year old boys. And it's been done a few times where there's been soccer, soccer, um, football matches and other um, sports where 15, 16 year old boys have been against the Olympic women and have beaten them. So it's not it's not a new thing. It did actually remind me a little bit, though, of the years that I spent training in the gym, watching these beginner schoolboys come in and start training. And I was the best female weightlifter in Australia for quite a few years. And yet after just a few months, some of these boys were lifting almost comparable weights in some lifts. To me and it was demoralizing except for the fact that I could tell myself that biology matters. So for 21 years um, I was drug tested to ensure that I was not cheating by doping or drug taking. So in a power sport like weightlifting that would usually be for anabolic steroids like testosterone. So basically it, it doesn't suddenly make you Arnold Schwarzenegger the next day that you wake up, it, it helps you to train harder and faster and it actually helps your muscles recover so that they get bigger and stronger. It allows you basically to train back-to-back -back heavy training sessions every day. So um, as an elite athlete, the drug testing that I underwent was regular urine tests and blood tests, both in competition and also out of competition, including during training sometimes or at my home and no notice was given for some of these tests when the testers turned up. So being elite, I also had to submit paperwork um, to the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority where I would actually guarantee my whereabouts for one hour every single day in case they wanted to come and test me. Um, and I remember having to submit this three months in advance um, and even when I was on my honeymoon, I had to tell them the location of where we were staying. So I'm explaining the following details now to really highlight what I was required to do as an elite athlete to ensure that I wasn't cheating so that the competition would be fair. So I'm not sure if um, you know what a drug test involves in the sporting world. It's definitely different to um, in the workplace because when I had my workplace drug test, I turned up and was about to get undressed and they freaked out. Um, but in sport, when you have a drug test, um, it's it's so that the drug tester actually sees the athlete passing the urine from their body into the beaker. So um, a, the, the, a collection officer um, of the same sex will stand there and watch the stream of urine leave your body and enter the cup. So the athlete has to be unclosed from, the, from basically chest down to knees so that they have an unobstructed view. So my first drug test was when I was 15. So you can imagine, you know, the nerves and then having to do that multiple times throughout my career. So for 21 years, I did this naked drug test um, to ensure that I was not drug taking, that I wasn't cheating, that I didn't have an advantage over my competitors. So you can imagine my upset and frustration and confusion and feeling of injustice when I first realized I'd be competing against a biological male as a transgender athlete. All the physical biological benefits that I just mentioned of males over females, together with testosterone levels, upwards of 30 to up to 70 times higher than your average female athlete, just does not allow for fair competition and just doesn't make sense. So I have heard arguments that now that these bigger, heavier males are powered by such low testosterone that they're actually at a disadvantage 
Um, but I don't agree. And the science doesn't back that up because these athletes have still had years and years of training and having the benefits of testosterone and they're still taller and faster. Um, the uh, There's a slide there. I'm pretty sure the next slide. Um, it actually shows throughout pregnancy the amount of testosterone that babies have. So um, I've had three girls. So I followed the girl graph there and noticed the testosterone levels, you know, as they were growing in trimester one, two, three. Um, and my last little baby was a boy and I could notice that um, the testosterone levels were much higher for the boys before they're born. So we're not talking about an advantage that suddenly happens with these boys at the age of 12, which is the which is a, a cutoff in lots of sports that after 12, then you can um, allow for girls only in, in some sports here in Australia. So from conception, boys have higher testosterone levels than girls. Um, there's also a psychological advantage um, in sport for males who have already lifted certain weights um, compared to females who have never lifted those weights before. Probably don't have heaps of time to go into that, but I'm sure you understand that as a as a male athlete, if you're lifting you know much heavier weights, if you lower your testosterone to compete against the women and you're coming up to lift a weight that you've lifted before, normally psychologically it's going to be a little bit easier um, than for a female that's never attempted that weight before. So um, one thing that I mentioned um, with the testosterone that the testosterone provides um, is not only the ability to train longer and harder and more often, which means bigger, stronger and faster muscles, but it also actually increases the number of myonuclei, so tiny little muscle fibers within the muscle. It actually, they increase in number and they permanently increase in number. So that's why it's actually an irreversible advantage. And that's why some years ago, the IOC actually brought in a life ban for the second doping offense because they recognized that if an athlete was prepared to dope once, um, that would actually give them an irreversible advantage, um, not just the bigger, stronger muscles, but actually an increase in muscle fibers that never goes back. Um, and so that that's a natural advantage that men have with that high testosterone level. So lastly, and really importantly, um, this was been a, this has been a big one that um, I mentioned to lots of sports down at this big round table conference we had at the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, I think it was me with a different view to every single other person in that in that round table. but um, I mentioned from my experience, the menstrual cycle of a female athlete is incredibly taxing on the body and it affects your training. It affects your training program. So there's only just even recently been more studies that have finally been done in this area um, so that an, a female athlete can have their training program modified during the menstrual cycle. There's actually a, a quite a significant increase in um, injury during this period of time where hormones change um, amongst other psychological factors um, that women can't always help during that period of time. Um, there's also laxity in joints, which makes them stretchier and looser, um, which cause actually um, a slower athletic speed. So when when your female athlete comes in um, and they look slow and and tired and everything hurts all the time, um, that's a couple of days of training that their training needs to be altered um, to accommodate for the menstrual cycle. And this is obviously something that um, doesn't affect biological men. Um, so on average, that would be about three to five days that the weights had to change to be a little bit lighter. Um, and so that's a training load of potentially a week out of every month. And when you add that up, that's actually around one year out of every four year Olympic buildup. So that's a significant amount of time that a female has to change the training program because of biology, because of the menstrual cycle, um, something that a, a, that a male will never be affected by one year out of every four years. So um, I'm not competing anymore. Um, I decided to finish competing the day that I found out I wouldn't be able to ever get a world master's record due to this transgender biological male breaking that record by about 20 kilos on each lift. That was sort of like my last my last thing that I wanted to get was a, was a world master's record. Um, I'm here because I know how hard that I work to be recognised as a top athlete in what was for a long time a male-dominated sport. How hard I know how hard I train to improve and lift big weights year after year, and I know firsthand how unfair it felt to stand up right next to a biological male, a transgender athlete, being announced in my category at the Commonwealth Games. 
Um, I don't want other women and girls to experience this unfairness. And I'm talking about a sport that doesn't even include combat um, or tackling or any physical, you know, physicalness in that regard. Um, I've got three daughters. They're all pursuing sport in some capacity. My oldest daughter um, is 11 and she just came forth at the National Judo Championships a few weeks ago. And I know what she looks like when she trains against boys. And I know how hard it is, even for some of the smaller, lighter little boys that she that she um, wrestles and that she trains against. Um, she has to work really, really hard. And, and even from that young age, it you can see a difference in physicality. My middle daughter is seven and she, uh, I was her soccer coach for the last two years. And again, even at that age of five and six, I can see the physical differences in the boys and the girls, um, the aggression um, and just the the way that the only the top girls can really keep up with the average boys. So my concern really is for fairness. So it's it's for girls not wanting to compete and train against boys for being worried about being hurt or simply not wanting to be beaten by boys. Um, and of course, I'm really concerned about um, sports camps and change room facilities where parents are not gonna be told which kids are in those change rooms. They're not gonna know that there's boys and girls um, changing and, and are in the change rooms. And we've heard that from, from swimmers around the world. They've already experienced that. Um, we had that issue when we had um, that athlete come and compete in Australia. We had to think about how do we how do we resolve this issue? How do we have an audience full of um, full of people watching our sport and their children using the same bathrooms as this transgender athlete? So why do we separate boys and girls races at carnivals for fairness? Why do we have Olympic competitions in men's and women's events for fairness? A female that pursues competitive or elite sport is not competing for fun. We want to win. And including trans athletes means that in general and on average when competing against biological men, women aren't going to win. So um, I came sixth at the Olympics and um, at the Beijing Olympic Games and I have no issue being beaten by my competitors in a fair competition. I'm okay with that, but I'm just not okay with being beaten by bi biological male. Um, so in the last six years, I have been repeatedly asked uh, how did it feel to compete against a transgender athlete? And in short, as I've mentioned, it felt completely unfair. The athlete weighed about 50 kilos heavier than me and was about 15, 15 to 20 centimetres taller than me and started on a weight that was 12 kilos more than anybody else in the competition. So started on 120 kilos when the winner ended up lifting 108 kilos. Significant difference. So fairness underpins all sport. And when I was asked by the media at the Commonwealth Games um, how I felt about the situation and when I when I discussed it with them that I felt that this was completely unfair, um, they actually told me very strongly to think about um, what I said on this topic and that if I said anything that was against the ideals of the Commonwealth Games and inclusion in sport, um, that I could be removed from the village. So I made sure that I said it after the competition. Um, the first time I actually researched the history of transgender athletes, I did find a lot of information about intersex athletes um, and really mainly about that South African runner who had naturally elevated testosterone levels equivalent to a man, was raised as a girl, had all appearances as a female, and she didn't even know about her high testosterone levels until she was drug tested as an athlete. Um, and she was told that she had to lower her testosterone levels in order to compete. So intersex is also known as disorders of sex development, and it's a naturally occurring um, variety of congenital conditions. And around that time, there was a few transgender athletes who were asked to write a paper about transgender athletes in sport. And this category was basically effectively just joined with the intersex athletes, um, which in my mind are two completely separate, um, two completely separate categories. Um, so on the next slide, uh, I believe it has the... Um, just basically the current situation here in Australia. Um, sport Australia is basically guidance for sport here. Every national sporting organisation has policies, but they need to adhere to the Sport Australia guidelines and policies. And they all filter down to our state level sports. So I'm sure it's a similar structure um, in New Zealand where you have your sporting clubs, your state, and then your national organisations, and then you have your, your overall sport New Zealand. Under the Federal um, Sex Discrimination Act, you can't discriminate on the basis of gender identity. 
all sports must accept membership and allow transgender athletes to compete and train and access bathrooms and change rooms of whichever one they choose. Um, but there's one permanent exemption and it's called the competitive sporting activity exemption um, where only in a competitive sporting activity where strength, stamina and physique of competitors is relevant can you discriminate and say no, a male can't compete. I mean, I don't know any sports that don't have strength, stamina and physique as being relevant because in my mind that's the whole idea of sport. Um, but uh, the Act doesn't define what strength, stamina, physique mean or even what competitive sporting activity means. So um, federal courts said that there can be exemption if when both sexes compete against each other, it would be an uneven and unfair competition because of the strength, stamina and physique of the male and female competitors. Again, every sport um, is subject to that. So I can't think of any sport that doesn't require those things. Um, so the next slide just has uh, Sport Australia has just released their transgender inclusion guidelines for sport. And it, it stresses that it's just a guideline. Um, you know, it's just it's just ideas. It's not really for every sport that has to follow it. Um, but basically sports are going to follow the guidelines because they don't want to have liability. They want to be able to say it was Sport Australia that told us to do it. So it took years for the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, to actually come back with their inclusion policy in this area. When it was finally released, they emphatically also stated that this policy and framework um, wasn't binding on international sporting federations. This kind of makes me wonder why on earth you would do it. But anyway, they just wanted to basically say that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Every sport has to de develop their own guidelines and policies with their own criteria. But the number one, the number one issue that they want is inclusion. I mean, in my mind, if you wanted to include and really be fair about inclusion, every single country on this on this earth would have every single sporting facility available and every single male and female athlete would be able to compete in every sport that they wanted. The Olympics is not about inclusion. The Olympics is about winning and winning medals for your country. So in my mind, you can't separate grassroots sport because every elite female athlete starts somewhere. I started in club sport. I started little athletics when I was eight years old. Had I been beaten by a boy in every race, I may not have kept on competing. So I don't think that you can just say, let's have one thing for grassroots sport. And then when it comes to elite sport, we'll change and do something different. I just don't think that that's fair and that that'll work. Then they talk about prevention of harm. We don't want, it's the prevention of harm is not about injury to female athletes, but it actually mentions the psychological, the psychological harm of a transgender athlete if they are not included in their preferred category. So when I read prevention of harm, I read, oh good, we don't want women injured when they're tackled on the football field, but that's not actually what that talks about. Number three is not to discriminate. Number four is about fairness. And yeah, it goes on. It's difficult to read. So the IOC, I think there's a chart there I've got, um, which has got lots of arrows on it. The IOC sends the issues back to the international federations. They send it back to the national sporting organisations who call Sport Australia for their advice. So Sport Australia, like the IOC, don't consider their policies as binding, which then leaves national sports trying to deal with the issue and the questions coming from the clubs that ring up and the state organisations to say, hey, what do we think about this issue? Could they be sued? So one thing, um, yeah, that I mentioned before was that the, the Sex Discrimination Act doesn't extend to children under 12 years old. So if if basically you've got any competition in, with under 12 year olds, then any boy can compete in any category and any girl can compete in any category. Um, so looking at my daughter who looks like she's about 16, but she's 11, um, yeah, I don't know how that would go if she was competing against a boy. So I do apologise that got a little bit legal and um, a little bit uh, complicated towards the end there, but um, coming from a legal background as well, I think that's the issue. I've got my personal story of, of how I got involved in the sport and how it felt to me, but also, you know, the legal issue and where it stands at the moment. I was so happy to see that World Aquatics and World Athletics are taking a very sensible approach. Um, I don't like that there's a 12-year cutoff and that kids may be pushed into making a decision very young to, to 
think about what they want to be. I mean, my daughter dressed up to be a cat for about four years. So, um, you know, kids don't know what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, I just hope that you can have kids have sensible parents that are raising them the right way. So to conclude, our world is broken and it's really in God's hands when that's going to change. Um, injustices and unfairnesses, bad laws and policies are just really a sign of the broken world that we live in. But as a Christian, I do want to be kind and loving and patient with everybody. Um, obviously, I want to be a light and a good example to other people. I want everyone to play sport. I want everyone to have the ability to compete at a high level in sport if they choose. But the competition must be fair and fairness underpins all sport. So I just want to really encourage you to speak up where you can. Thank you. 